Before introducing Alex, um, I just want to drop attention to this little tiny animal in uh, the middle, the second animal, GitHub. Uh, I'm going to guess that everybody knows GitHub. We all love GitHub. Uh, it seems to me that GitHub sponsors pretty much everything, so if you ever happen to, uh, to <laughs> do a conference or organize the birthday party of your daughter, ask them. They might want to sponsor them, which is awesome. Uh, there are um, there are super super community-ish. Uh, Scotty talk about community. If there is one thing being community is GitHub. So GitHub hosts your Git's and don't tell anybody, but they actually host SVN as well. Subversion. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that hurts a little bit. Thanks to them. All right, the next guy, Alex. Um, I just figured out the the the. Keynote presenter display doesn't show the notes. Some, some, uh, you don't have notes, right? You, you do everything, because some, some other speaker might kill me. So we have to think about this. But I remember what I had to say about Alex. Uh, well, Alex is still trying to understand my questions, uh, but I, I'm going to come back to that in a, in a moment. Um, I actually uh, first met uh, Alex at Macoon, like uh, some of you. Um, for those who don't know what Macoon is, for those not being in Germany, it's a German conference in German, uh, which is in three weeks from now, uh, and they existed before uh, me, actually, in 2009. And um, I love the Macoon, and um, Uli is also involved in the Macoon. Uh, he works at uh, Deutsche Telekom, where we actually met again, because it turns out we kind of worked together, not really, but in the same department. Uh, we had a, had a lot of fun uh, for a couple of weeks or months. The Aspis Lags last year, they were the brother Aspis Lags, Ken and Glass, used, used to call them the Mac Daddy, but for me, he is the, he is the real Mac Daddy because he's been doing this thing for forever. Obviously, not comparable at any level to Reiner's Mac Daddy level-ish, because Reiner is, has been doing this stuff also for 200 years. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say about, um, about Alex is that Alex is part of my secret weapon as a developer. And what is my secret weapon? My secret weapon is this guy, <laughs> my iChat battle list. Um, <laughs> Alex is on top of it, for example. So actually, the first person I'm always thinking about to write is actually Alex, because you're the first in the list. <laughs> Um, and then goes a long list of different people which I uh, bother around. And now and then I will ask a question to Alex and his answer would be most of the time like, I don't understand your question. But uh, it's fine, I understand he doesn't understand me. Maybe you can um, <laughs> give me the reply. Anyway, everybody welcome and give a round of applause for um, Alex von Bellower. Thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. Um, I have an introduction slide, too. As I said, my name is Alexander Von Bello, and I work for a tiny, tiny company. And um, we make the mobile stuff for Deutsche Telekom and other customers. Now. It's interesting that he mentioned that I don't understand his question. That is not entirely true. But most of the people who worked with me, my team, everybody, they know my favorite question. My favorite question is always why. And because he, he mentioned this, I would like to give that to you as a little hint. It is the most important question. The question is always, why? And so when you ask me for, a program, for programming advice, what I will do is I will ask, why are you trying to do this? What is your ultimate goal? Because especially when helping other people, it is important to know what is the ultimate goal. You might already be running into a different direction you might have taken the wrong route already. So I need to understand what is, what is, is it what you're actually trying to achieve. So this is why I don't understand his questions. And he's often reluctant to tell me what he's really trying to achieve. But it's important to remember why we do things so that we can do things efficiently. 
And even if it's clear, it's often good when you're in a discussion with your team to recall why we're doing it, motivation. So let's talk about motivation. Why, why are we talking about something as boring as memory here? Memory, first of all, is a shared and limited resource. There's only a certain amount of it in any given device, and all of the applications and the system running on that device, they're all sharing it. There are a lot of misconceptions about memory. Now, Bill Gates never said that 640K should be enough for anybody. There's no proof that he ever said that, and he himself said he said a lot of stupid things, but he'd never said that. Byte Magazine, however, I have the quote, said in 1985, what would anyone ever do with one megabyte of RAM? Because Apple put that in the new Macintosh. So they had no clue why anybody would want one megabyte of RAM. Um, I don't know about this group, I don't know where you're coming from, but a lot of mobile developers, they're coming from the Java world, and things are a bit different on iOS and on OS X. So it's important to recall some basic differences, especially because in the modern um, environment that we have, it's easy to forget about these differences. Coming back to the limited and shared resource, on the iPhone 3GS, which doesn't run the new operating system anymore, we have 256 megabytes of RAM, and currently we're going up to 1 GB. That's the amount of memory you can work with. Something that's also often misunderstood, and that's, I hope I'm not boring the most of you, the iPhone, does have virtual memory management. It, however, does not have swapping. Those are two different things. Does anyone, does everybody here know what the difference between virtual memory management, virtual memory and swapping is? Who knows? Okay, I'll explain. <laughs> so, you have virtual memory. Virtual memory, you have a lot, especially with like, I heard there are new phones coming up and supposedly they're 64 uh, bit. They have even more virtual memory. On the current selling iPhones, you have four gigabytes of virtual memory, even though your phone just has maybe 256 megabytes of real memory. Now, then you have a lot less RAM. Whenever now the system tries to get something into memory, it talks to virtual memory. That's really what the apps or what you are talking to. You are never talking, unless you're a kernel developer, you're never talking to Wiregram. The virtual memory system then tries to allocate this in real RAM. And this goes on for a while, until your real memory is filled up. Why are we doing this? Those pages can be shared for certain things. Otherwise, it wouldn't make much of a difference, but also to have a secure separation between the apps, so that every app thinks it has all of those four gigabytes for itself, or at least part of it and cannot snoop into other applications memory. Now, what do we do when we try to allocate another um, page in virtual memory? Huh, RAM is full. And if we are on OS X or another system where we have swapping, then something from, virtual, from the RAM can go to the storage space, to the disk, to the SSD, to tape, whatever. And we have enough space in real memory to allocate that page. Again, we do not have 
storage space. We do not have swapping in iOS. iOS does not try to push your memory onto um, the SSD. Apple has always been very, very clever in um, making memory management as easy as possible. So a while ago in Coco, we had manual memory management. It was better than on a lot of systems, and it had a lot of benefits. Objects would be freed instantly when they're no longer needed. It was pretty fast, and it was predictable, meaning if you've done everything right and if you understood how this works, you could tell when an object would be deallocated, when it goes boof. The problem with this um, manual memory management was it was still manual, so the responsibility was with the developer, with you. If you made a mistake, things would go boom. It also required the developers to write a good deal of boilerplate code. Everything um, had to be bracketed in those retain and release statements. You'll see that in a while. And all in all, it was a whole lot of pain. Even though it worked pretty well, Apple thought we need to change it because crashing apps due to memory management errors, that was the number one reason for apps to crash. So on OS X, Apple also looked at garbage collection. And from Java, you also, oh, classic mistakes with um, mem manual memory management were leaks. That means you had unused leftover memory, stuff you weren't using anymore, but it still was floating around in your application space. It was clogging up um, your, your app's memory, and you could see that in instruments, your app slowly rising. And the other is accessing memory that's not owned by you or anyone for that matter. And what you'd get is this exec bad excess error. So going back, Apple looked at garbage collection. Garbage collection looks nice. It absolutely reduces crashes. There's no cleanup code. You don't have to go after your objects and clean them up. And it's very easy to use. However, especially in OS X, Apple was very proud of their implementation of garbage collection. They also found out that it has some serious drawbacks. The garbage still builds up. And at some point, the garbage collector would kick in and would clean it all up. And that would cause a performance hit. And it was also non-deterministic, so you would know when the garbage collector comes and kicks in. So you couldn't prepare for that. We could see that on OS X, because on OS X, you needed a two-core machine or more to run garbage collecting apps um, with enough performance. Basically, one core was needed to keep the garbage collector happy. So there was always the question, when would garbage collection come to iOS? Especially because at that point, multi-core iOS devices were nowhere in sight. So what Apple tried to do, Apple tried to combine the best of garbage collection and memory management, uh, manual memory management. And they call that 
automatic retain counting. Automatic retain counting still instantly frees object, objects. It has a smooth performance. It has very predictable behavior. It reduces the crashes. There's no object cleanup code, and it's very, very easy to use. And for those of you who are not using Arc, and maybe those who do, I would like to go in a little bit deeper about using this wonderful system. It's quite easy. You just tick the sticker, and a little birdie has told me that the new version of Xcode doesn't, even, doesn't have that anymore. It's on by default. And another sideline, include unit tests. Yes, include unit tests. And the same birdie told me that it, that's also default on a newer version of the Xcode. So what do you do when you switch to Arc? When you have old code, then the compiler will, al will automatically show you what you cannot use anymore. And all you have to do to use Arc is you leave stuff out. You can't use all of these things. That's all the uh, code that you had to write I was telling you about. Oops. All that goes away, and this is how it looks in Arc. So you see we've lost quite a number of lines. Would you like to see the last slide again? You look confused. So we have this little implementation of a class some standard stuff. We have a description, and we're turning an auto-released string. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. And we're having a setter. You see that if a new variable is, if, there, if you're trying to set a new variable, then first you're checking if you're trying to modify the same pointer, that would be good. And you're releasing the old stuff, and you're retaining the new stuff. And down there, you have object cleanup code, the whole dialog thing, where you need to clean up after yourself. And all of these things go away. And what we have is we can just return in a string alloc init with format for the description. And for the setter, we can just say that we set the instance variable to the new variable. We don't have to care about checking it. We don't have to care about releasing the old stuff and retaining the new stuff. All of this goes away. Still confused? You can ask me later about this. Or maybe things will clear up. Another thing that we have is a few more attributes. And the most important attributes that you have are strong and weak. Strong is a good old strong reference. It means you want to keep that object alive. You need that object. You need to work with it. It shouldn't go away while you're not looking. Weak is different. Weak is a weak reference. It does not retain ownership of an object. So basically what you're saying is, yeah, it's fine. I like this object a lot, but if it goes away, I don't care. And the thing is, your reference to that object will automatically become nil if the object is destroyed. Why is this so nice? The Java people here will now shriek and they'll say, what, nil? 
my app will crash. No, it will not. In Objective-C, it is perfectly safe to send messages to nil. Nothing will happen, but it's safe. Why are we using weak? What's, why do we need it? Why would anyone think of something like that? The most important aspect of weak is to avoid so-called retain cycles. But before we come to the retain cycle, I would like to give you a little demonstration of how this automatic zeroing th weak thing works. So we have this one object, the big red one in the middle, and other objects are referencing it. The dark blue ones are, they have a strong reference. So that means as long as I'm using this object, don't take it away from me. The light blue one in the middle um, below just has a weak reference. Now, if this object says I don't need the, the red object anymore, it's still in memory. It's still kept around because the other dark blue object still needs it. However, if that object now says I don't need it anymore, It goes away, and that reference is automatically set to nil. What's a retain cycle? A retain cycle is something that you still have to care about, even with ARC. ARC takes a lot of things away from you, but ARC is not magic. Retain cycle is something like this. Say you have a person, and you have a company, and you have a relation between them, maybe you call that workplace, and the company has employees. And of course, one of those employees is the person. When all of these relationships here are strong references, basically you won't get it away because the person is referencing the company and the company is reference, referencing the person. So basically the person says keep the company alive and the company says keep the person alive. It would be hard to get that out of memory. So what you do in ARC is you make one of those and you have to use due diligence to find out which of them. You declare one of them weak so that you can safely go ahead and delete your objects and they won't reference each other in such a vicious circle. Let's look about, let's look a bit more, how does ARC actually work? Why does ARC do the things it does and why does it do them so well? ARC is not a runtime, uh, mostly, not a runtime thing. ARC is a compiler thing. Up there, you see the Objective-C code. And down there, you see that ARC has injected a call to store this strong, to make it a strong reference. You look at other stuff. This is a standard setter. It's a synthesized setter for my string. And as you've seen in the other slide before, what you had to do in manual memory management you first had to release the old variable and then retain the new variable. And as we would expect, this is exactly what ARC has put into the code here. You can see the retain and release 
the same way that you will, would have put it into um, your code if you had done mem uh, manual uh, memory management. And if we look at the other example, and a string alloc in it with format, you can see up there, well, you can't, so I labeled them. And a string alloc in it with format. And then down here, just as we did in the manual memory management example, we're returning it auto-released. Everything that you used to do in your, in your manually managed code is now automatic. How does this weak thing work? Well, the weak thing works by putting in those calls to objects of C store weak and load weak. So when you're accessing a weak variable, you're not accessing it directly. But instead, the compiler puts in this Objective-C load weak in there. And the same way, the same thing applies for the setter. It puts a store weak. And those load weak and store weak things, they will take care, um, this is where the magic happens. This is where the automatic zeroing happens. Now, you may want to know a little bit about arcs not really so dirty secrets. Things that may get overlooked, and how ARC does some very, very nifty tricks. Sometimes, and that's known from other sciences, we can, for example, under, better understand illnesses, or we, we can better understand the healthy person if we look at illnesses in the sick person. So let's look at some evil error that I had. Suddenly, in my app, an exec bad access at the address one popped out. Hmm, one is pretty, pretty clearly an illegal address. So much so clear. It happened in Objective-C retain when we look up the stack trace. When going back the stack trace to code that was actually from me, I found it in here. I was completely puzzled. What? There's an if, it's a Boolean, or it shouldn't care, it could be anything. It could be a pointer or a Boolean. Who knows? It should never crash in retain. How, why? Like, there's no good reason why this would ever go to retain. Um, it's just a comparison. You know, you get the value from there, you compare, if it's zero, period. What's, what's the retain thing? What's happening here? So, basically, what the fuck? What's going on here? Of course, programmer error. Arc, there are no, mis no known mistakes in Arc. What I've done is I had implemented a base class which returned a pointer, and through some silly and bad refactoring, in one of the derived class, I returned a bool. Here I'm returning the pointer, and here I'm returning the bool. So I screwed up. And um, that should solve the problem, right? Why was that retained? Again, it shouldn't matter. If I'm returning a pointer or returning a Boolean, compare it to zero, what? Looking at assembly helps. Looking at assembly helps you to understand what is going on in your code. And so I opened the assembly window and looked again, what is, what is really happening there? And you see this 
odd call here. Objective C retain auto released return value. Mm -hmm. There we have in retain. That's a call that I've never seen in manual memory management. Some fact that's um, little known is that the Objective C runtime is actually open source. You can go and look at it. So, and this is exactly what I did. Go to the Apple open source site and see what does this call actually do. And you find some very interesting comments in there. Fast handling of returned auto released values. The caller and the callee cooperate to keep the returned object out of the auto release pool. Does everybody here know what the auto release pool is? Who doesn't? Everybody here knows, good. I can quiz everybody. Well, so the callee checks if the caller has this call objective C retain auto release return value. And it does so, whoops, by means of a non-operating assembler instruction, move R7, R7. That's what it puts in there as a marker. So the callee knows that the caller is expecting um, something that's working with ARC. What the callee does there is, if that is the case, then it will not put this value into the auto release pool. It will keep it like it is. Uh, if, if it is not there, it will put the value into the auto release pool. So that code that's non arc can work with arc code. If it is there, it does not do that. Retain auto released return value, however, goes ahead and retains that value. It does that so that we have a consistent behavior because whatever the callee did, if the callee was arc or non-arc, after the retain auto released return value, we have a, re a retained uh, object. So if you understand nothing about all of this, two things are important to remember. One, it improves the interworking of ARC code with non-ARC code. If you're using an old library that doesn't use ARC, you can still use it with your code that uses ARC or vice versa. And it also speeds up things because it doesn't put things into the auto release pool. The auto release pool was something very, very clever when Apple introduced memory, um, the, the whole manual memory management for Coco. Because in other languages, you always have the question, who's responsible for destroying an object? In other languages, things like this descriptor, description, you would have to have some sort of agreement who destroys the object that falls out of the description. In Objective-C, you could just say, I'm putting it into the auto-release pool, meaning the caller does not have to care about um, who will release it. The caller can retain it to keep it around for a longer time or can just say, you know, I and as log it out to the console and be done with it. <clears throat> then the auto release pool will come along 
and release this object as a proxy for the original callee. This is very nice. However, of course, it's effort, so it costs you performance. And therefore, Arc tries to minimize the use of the auto-release pool as much as possible. And this is the reason why the code crashed. Is the auto-release pool superfluous in Arc? No, it is not. Especially because not everything, even in Apple's frameworks, they have not eliminated the auto-release pool from everything there. It's still in there. Also, you might be using libraries that are not Arc. Um, so when you're doing things in a tight loop, meaning you're not going to the main run loop while you're doing them. You should still put this auto release pool bracket around your code. Because what that does is all the auto released objects that are within this bracket will be released when the bracket is closed. So when we put like a while or a for statement around this, this will make sure that the auto release pool is killed, is emptied, is flushed after every iteration. There's a number of new other arc attributes besides weak and strong. For example, and as returns retained or auto releasing. Mostly, you don't have to be concerned with them. They are used when you mix ARC code with non-ARC code. Because, and we'll see that in a while, there are naming conventions. And ARC knows about these naming conventions. And so, when for whatever reason you are violating those naming conventions, you still have the possibility to tell the compiler what you intended to do without relying on the naming conventions. And this is also important. Where does ARC fail us? ARC is not garbage collection. ARC does not work for classic C code for standard C code. It does not work for C++ code. So it does not handle your mallocs, your freeze, or your news for you. The same goes to, for core foundation. Core foundation is C code. So of course, ARC does not work here. So especially in core foundation code, you have to know the COCO naming conventions. When code creates an object with alloc new create or copy, or things that are called copy something, copy mutable, um, CF create with string or something, then you own them. You are responsible for them. You are especially responsible for um, releasing them. The same goes if you call CF retain on an object. And when working with core foundation, you still need to call CF retain if you want to make sure that nobody's taking away this object while you're still working with this. Or in core foundation, I should say this reference, uh, not quite objects. So when you're done with this object, you must send it a CF release, or when you're in objective C code, without arc, put it into the auto release pool or release it. As I said, arc knows these rules. So when you call a method, say, new employee, then arc will assume that you want a return, retained value returned from that, not an auto-released value. And it will act accordingly. 
as I said, if you don't want to do this, if you want it to behave differently, then you need to use those um, specifiers. iOS and macOS 10 also have so-called bridged objects. Some foundation objects have counterparts in the Cocoa world. We call that toll-free bridged. For example, there's, NS, uh, there's CF string ref and NS string pointer. They can be used interchangeably. When we still had manual retain counting, it was really interchangeable. The same rules apply to both of them. Now with ARC, we have to make sure that the transition between the non ARC foundation code and the ARC Objective C code works. For that, we have bridging. The very nice thing is Xcode will suggest bridges for you. When you have a core foundation object, you don't have to memorize all of this because Xcode will give you a few options. You should, however, know about these options and what they mean. So what you can say is you can say bridge, and that means you have no transfer in ownership. So whoever originally created this object will have to deal with it in the appropriate manner. So if you have created this reference object in core foundation, you still will have to send it a CF release. Also, you have to make sure that your Objective-C code does not reference it anymore because CF release will not automatically zero your references. Then you have bridge retained or CF bridging retained. You can use this as a specifier or as a um, function. This transfers the ownership of your Objective-C object to a core foundation pointer. So basically it's taken out of ARC. ARC says, I don't have to do anything with this anymore. Your core foundation code has to handle it. That means you will have to call CF release on that object. The other way around, you can do a um, bridge transfer or bridging release, it transfers the, the ownership to an Objective-C pointer, to an Objective-C object, and thus puts it into ARC. Therefore, if you would then go ahead and still use a C of release on that, your app will still crash because of an exec bad access. Because either ARC or you are trying to release memory that ha has already been freed. So after you use bridge transfer or bridging release, the object is an arc, and arc will handle it. There are a number of little, 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 little arc details. One of them is be careful with objects in C structures. You can do that. There's unsafe, unretained. I hope you all think that sounds very ugly and dangerous. Avoid it. There's no trivial cast from ID to void anymore. It used to be that you could basically just take a void pointer and um, transfer it to any Objective-C um, object. That doesn't work anymore. You have to use bridging for that. You can't use variables anymore that collide with the naming conventions. For example, if you have a variable, an instance variable that's called new customer, Arc will tell you that this is a no-go. Arc by default for Objective-C code is not exception safe. This is good because I hope you're not using exceptions in your Objective-C code anyhow. You shouldn't. So therefore, it's not exception safe. Meaning, if you throw an exception, ARC will not clean up all the objects. 
they will leak, they will still hang around. You can enable this cleaning up, but of course that means your code will bloat because at any point where an exception could possibly be called, Arc will stuff in all sorts of release statements. So if you really need this, you can use F Objective-C Arc exceptions to enable this cleaning up in exceptions for Arc. On the other hand, it's set by default in Objective-C++. I don't know who did this. Somebody called Objective-C++ a shotgun marriage made in hell, which it absolutely is, but um, I think it's safe to say that that's a pretty smart assumption that Objective-C++ code may use exceptions and therefore it's turned on by default. Um, if you say no, I'm sure, right, I don't want this, I don't want exceptions in my Objective-C++ code either, you can say F no Objective-C arc exceptions to disable it. So, do we have time for questions? Does somebody have a question? Or have I puzzled you completely? We have time for questions because we have a long break after, so uh, go ahead. Um, you mentioned the move R7, R7 hint, mm -hmm. um, so that Arc knows that the value should be, uh, should not be auto put in the auto-release pool. Mm -hmm. That is for ARM. What is the equivalent instruction for uh, I386 or? I will look it up. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. I can look it up myself. I just thought <laughs> you <knew. laughs> I don't know. There's, there's something um, for next year. Things are a bit different on 64-bit platforms. There's, there's other stuff on 64-bit platforms. So there's, there's something else to look out for. Thanks. I'm doing too much iOS development, I fear. So uh, I was wondering, because the, the yeah, seam calls are actually different, is there a difference between uh, strong and retain? It's two different things. Strong says use retain. Oh, in the, in the um, no, in, in the specifiers. <laughs> And the specifiers, no, not not that I could not that I could see one. I, I was unable to see any difference between uh, strong and because you used to have retain was when we still had retain copy assign, and I could I was unable to see any sort of difference between strong and retain. And I had a second, maybe more complicated question which uh, occurred when I transferred my code to Arc. So I have some Arc code calling some non-Arc code. Mm -hmm. The Arc code uh, passes a, a reference, so ampersand variable. And on, on return, that variable is always set to nil, except if I add auto-releasing, the auto-releasing specifier to the mm -hmm. variable. Why is that? Interesting question. I, I was under the impression that with the new compilers, um, whenever you, was that a double reference or a single reference? So it was a double reference, yes. I was under the impression, um, maybe I'm wrong, I was under the impression that you don't have to specify auto-releasing anymore for double references. It's interesting to hear that it does something different. Because I was it, under the impression you don't have to do it anymore. Okay, it might have changed, because I didn't try that yesterday, so maybe now it would work. But, so at one point of time, it didn't work. It, yes, it okay, used so. to be at the, when ARC was first introduced, there was a difference between when you specified auto-releasing and when you didn't. But now they try to be so smart and they basically say if you use a double reference, star star, then it's a safe assumption to believe that you want this to be an auto-releasing value. 
Um, so I would say try again. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the, in your example about the ID and, and, and the bull. Mm -hmm. What actually was wrong with that? Why it was kicking in the auto-releasing stuff uh, in that particular case? Because the definition of the base class, the interface of the base class declared the ID. It declared a pointer. And my derived class did not declare its own interface. It just overrode the um, base classes implementation. And this is important to know. The compiler, for, for what I did there, the compiler does not issue a warning. It does not issue an error. It just takes it as it is, and the app just crashes. But Arc looks at, you know, Arc looked at the base class and looked at the interface for the base class and saw, oh, I'm getting an object. So I have to deal with it like with an object. And then, of course, it got the Boolean variable. In this case, one, illegal address, boom. Any more questions? All right. The last one, because I think, like, I have the feeling everybody's hungry. Uh, so um, did I understand it correctly that these move R7, R7 um, is something the um, called code, so something the function checks in the caller's code? So yes. it's checking the opcode? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, it's checking, <laughs> it's, it's checking if that opcode is... You so, know, so it's, it's, it's looking up the stack. Where was I called? And, and adds, I believe, um, I think I have the slide here. Um, it, it looks like four byte from the stack or something. So you, it takes an offset from the last caller's yeah. address and uh, checks if the opcode is something like that. And yes. The, oh, wow. oh, my God. That, that's a hack. <laughs> <laughs> On the but but it's a performant hack. Yeah, I think it's cool, but it's a hack. <laughs> Thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, All right. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I think the food will, should be ready. One last uh, note about this. Uh, the compiler doesn't warn you. I, I, I found a problem a couple of days ago, which you might run into as well. Um, I was using NS file manager, file that path, whatever URL, and I, I was giving an option, and this option is a constant, and this constant um, only exists in 10.8, 10 um, and I have, as a deployment target, 10.7. I had no warning whatsoever. The only result of that was the app crashing on 10.7 with uh, exec bad access. It might be a bug, but uh, so it means the, the, the conclusion would be it's not because it compiles that it's going to work. Um, and with that note, Jan, you have to say something? Yeah, but that's always been the case. You have to guard against all old versions uh, running your, your new, new code accessing new API stuff. It's still especially ugly for constants. For constants, it's especially ugly. But, but, well, it's always been the case. It's like, uh, I can't remember a day when it wasn't that way. Yeah, but it's easy for things like selectors and classes, but for, I can't remember what, what the best practice is, but it's ugly for, for constants. But you're hungry, I guess. We're hungry. So this is over there, I guess. I'm going to check. And uh, yeah, come on. Let's go.